All right, everyone, welcome uh, to whatever week it is. Uh, we've all lost a little bit track of time, um, but today we're super glad to have Antero Garcia and Audrey Waters with us for the Failure to Disrupt Book Club. Um, we're going to be talking about Chapter 6, the EdTech Matthew Effect, um, issues of inequality, issues of injustice, issues of structural inequality, um, and how they interact in the field of education technology. For those of you who are joining us live, it uh, would be great to have you introduce yourself in the chat um, and tell us who you are and where you're from and what your connection is to this work. Um, and uh, for those of you who are joining us remotely and afterwards, it's really great to have you. Um, but want to give a special welcome to Antero Garcia. Um, he's a faculty member at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Uh, he's a former uh, teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, Antero, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And I'm excited to jump into this work. Also, hi, Candace. I see you in the chat. Um, this is, yeah, this is going to be fun to uh, spend a little bit of time with all of you. So a, a place that we like to start is to ask guests to introduce themselves um, with their ed tech story. Um, and people have heard Audrey and my ed tech story, but if you can reach back into your past and tell us um, some moment where as a student or as a teacher, you sort of had an encounter with learning technologies and, and uh, especially something that maybe sort of shaped your trajectory and, and how you ended up doing what you do now. So. I usually tell the kind of uplifting story around kids and cell phones, which then led to a more demoralizing story around trying to think about using cell phones in classrooms. Uh, but I think instead of that, my last year when I was in the classroom, I was finishing up my PhD um, and the school kind of deputized me as the smart board guy in addition to everything else that I was supposed to be doing. I guess it also kind of gives like a two to three year range of like when I was teaching too. You were, um, a high, you were a high school English teacher in oh yeah, sorry, should, Los yeah, Angeles Unified? I was a high school English teacher in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and um, finished did, in you, my, my, did you grow up in LA? Are you from I there up, originally? I grew up in San Diego. And, okay, not far away. Uh, no, I, I basically got lazy and did all of my degrees at UCLA just for lack of you know inertia of wanting to move anywhere else. Too many books to pack up, I think, was the main issue. And so you know, I, I would basically spend a bunch of my day kind of roaming LA freeways going from um, a wider, wealthier part of LA, the west side to south central, then to the east side to get back to where I was living at the time. Um, and at the time, so we, our school invested something like half a million dollars in smart boards for most of the classrooms uh, without asking the teachers if they actually wanted them or thinking about what the use case of all of the smart boards would be. Uh, and so my job was to go from classroom to classroom and show teachers Here's, here's your smart board that someone put into your room and is now taking up a whole bunch of space, right? Uh, here's, here's how you plug in your computer if you happen to have a computer, if you want to use it that way. Um, oh, and then if you actually wanted to write on the, I think, you know, half of the classrooms already had like Sharpie or whiteboard marking on the smart board because no one had told them it doesn't function as a whiteboard. Um, and I think I, it was just the kind of confrontation of who put all of this junk uh, in people's rooms without asking them about it or giving them any kind of proper support, right? Like who was I as a teacher to tell them, here's what your smart board is supposed to do. Um, that generally still is my sentiment about smart, maybe we can just spend the next hour talking about smart boards, I have, I have feelings. Um, actually, <laughs> it's like it's being angry at smart boards, being angry at the people who made them, being angry at the people who bought them. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think maybe that's my, that's my ed tech encounter with the, oh, there's forces at work here that are directly impacting young people and their teachers uh, in ways where there's not a whole lot of agency at that level um, shaping the what's and the how's of, of the ed tech world. Uh, you know, I teach this class learning media and technology at MIT. Um, and early in the semester, I ask people to talk about their education technology experiences as students. And I'm definitely now just getting the smart board generation. Um, so I'm now like very consistently hearing from people who have stories, you know, from on the other side of what you just described, which is, oh, yeah, I remember this one year I came to school and all of the classrooms had smart boards and none of the teachers knew what to do with it. And they pretty much just used it to write on and to post notes on. And then a few years, like, you know, for the younger ones, it's like, and then when I graduated, they were gone um, or they were never used again. Um, you know, I wonder, and, and for me, of course, is like perfect for my class because, you know, at some point it comes up like, 
why did they do that? And they'd be like, yes, that is exactly what we're going to spend a semester trying to figure out. Like, why did they do that? Um, I like the, I like the ed tech paleontologist who's just kind of like <laughs> digging on old classroom, just finds like a room, like a warehouse full of smart boards, <laughs> trying to understand, like, trying to get yeah, the narrative of what this was about for, for one period. You could probably like do that. You could probably like do a whole history of like who was an exhibitor at ISTE you know, back, oh, for like, that, yeah. you know, and like, see, like, when, when all of a sudden it was, you know, the Promethean, Promethean had like the giant booth and, and when Apple went away, you know. That's right. Yeah, that's totally, yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. I love that. The archaeologists would be so happy to find Promethean. Maybe you have this sort of Greek connection to the, yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, I mean, all of the, all of these technologies have these kinds of stories around them. And I think the, the smart board story is remarkable for the, for the vast investment, the incredibly short life cycle that it went through. Um, uh, you know, it's it's particularly compelling, and maybe something we can keep coming back to. Um, you know, as as Susan points out, um, the issues of equity that are connected to making a huge investment into something that neither teachers and students really want, nor necessarily know what to do with, or aligned with their pedagogical philosophies, and who gets them and who doesn't, um, and what are you know what are the opportunity costs in different places? Those are those are great questions. Um, so we should just hear a little bit more um, since then. You, you do your doctoral work on how you and your yeah. students in Los Angeles are using cell phones um, in teaching and learning. And then what have you been up to more recently? You went to UC Boulder, but now you're at Stanford. What are, what are some of the things that are, that are occupying your research agenda now? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about a little bit about this before we got started. But I think the, the thing that I thought was going to... Uh, be occupying my interest this year all got thrown out with COVID, right? I think this is um, a necessary, I will not say game changer because it's not really a game, right? Life changer, it's a systemic changer um, in kind of illuminating the existing inequalities and making them even more transparent for folks. And so, you know, the, the past year has really shifted to try to support and understand stakeholder experiences of learning opportunities in light of COVID. So that's where I am right now. Uh, I'm working um, with the co-PI, Shelly Goldman, and we're working with four different districts out here in Palo, in the Palo Alto area, kind of surrounding districts, to think about um, how do students, parents, teachers, and administrators all kind of conceptualize what the learning opportunities are happening within school systems to try to get, you know, where are their discrepancies and kind of different different perspectives around, you know, what's happening in this year. And, there, you know, I think ed techs, hiding um, in different parts of each of those those stakeholder perspectives and so we'll see you know the, the goal is to talk to all of these participants several times throughout the year and and follow them um, before that i've mainly spent a bunch of time thinking about civic literacy practices what's it mean for young people as uh, and teachers in thinking about our, our role in society i think that that's one big part of the work that i do and the other side related is thinking about um, gameplay and storytelling i spent two and a half years uh, studying tabletop role-playing games and did very nerdy stuff uh, with a different kind of, you know, I think I would argue this is a kind of social technology of, you know, what are the systems of dice rolls and uh, probabilities that kind of guide reinforcements of racism and sexism uh, in gaming communities. And so that's, those have been kind of parallel spaces of civic stuff and gaming stuff uh, and usually being grumpy about technology along the way. All right, so we've got we've got plenty of technology grumpiness. Although you know, like you, I mean, this is important because I feel some kinship here. Um, we could be grumpy about we are like former teachers who did a whole bunch with technology in our classrooms, in part because we saw it as liberatory. Um, we saw it as empowering students, and we're like personally pretty invested in giving our students access to new technologies, developing their skills, um, and then being kind of enraged at the systems that make that so hard. Um, yeah, and maybe yeah I think that's great. Yeah. Um, well, good. Well, that's a great lead in to the chapter for this week, the EdTech Matthew Effect. Um, and, uh, you know, Antero and Audrey, in case there are folks who are listening who, ha who haven't read the chapter, it would be great to just give like a little overview of sort of what you took away as sort of the key themes from it. Um, and then we can start jumping into what we think, uh, you know, some of the important points are, some of the problems are, or other things like that. Um, uh, Antero, maybe you can start and then Audrey, you can, you can fill in. Yeah, I'll throw, I'll throw out a couple points. But Audrey, please jump in. I don't, I don't want to take too much of the space here. Um, I think, you know, I really, I really appreciated what this chapter is doing and the kinds of, I think the first, the laying out of a different, of three different kinds of myths around the role of technology. Uh, so the first is this idea, uh, which I'm hoping will push even more on of 
uh, technology is this great thing that will then disrupt uh, inequality and is going to somehow um, fix all of the social ills that aren't the fault of technology, right? But the fault of, I think, you know, large form of settler colonialism and capitalism, I think is, is largely how I think I, I would frame what those are about. Related to that, this idea that technology is somehow gonna, uh, the second myth that technology is gonna somehow democratize education Make, make again this kind of leveling factor, I think is the running theme throughout both of these myths, uh, feels like the next kind of um, big function. And again, this idea of a digital divide uh, as a thing that gets cleaved by something like Khan Academy or a smart board or a MOOC or insert whatever the other kind of, the badges, maybe we can talk about badges, maybe we can sneak that in. Uh, all, all of these things are gonna somehow kind of be the leveling factor. Um, it's just a thing that I think is, is the other myth that's present here. Um, the only thing that I would push on is, I know we get to like push further, but the thing I push here is it's not just digital divides. I would just say it's divides. Um, I think it's been convenient for us to talk about them as digital divides to kind of maybe modernize them to a bit, but that feels like the central piece. I think the chapter then largely focuses towards the end on the possibilities of design and of designers to imagine and push towards other kinds of possibilities that challenge what these myths are about. Um, I'd be really curious about where the kind of wither design in light of the pandemic, and maybe those are those are things we'll talk about later. But I think that's kind of my you know chapter in a nutshell summary. But I probably screwed things up, and maybe Audrey can you can fix it fix it all. Yeah, no, I think I I think that I think you nailed it. I mean, I think to me this is I would agree um, with it. This is this is such an important this is such an important chapter because I do think that the overarching myth that that um that education technology is going to sort of um uh address uh address inequality is going to make um students who uh students who struggled learn better faster uh cheaper um i think it's I think it's incredibly important to um to challenge that and i think that right now in this moment it's so important to talk about because i think there has been so much you know, at the at the outset, there was so much um, emphasis placed on. Uh, I think still is. We must get devices into students' hands. Um, we um, so I think we were sort of seeing that there was still a huge um, a huge gulf in who had access to devices and who didn't. But even so, sort of even if sort of even if every child did have a, a device. I think that this chapter helps illuminate that that's insufficient, right? That that's actually not going to address, you know, address the inequalities. And perhaps, perhaps even worse is that ed tech will reinscribe those inequalities. Yeah, that's, I think that that's exactly what we want to drill down into, you know, and, and, uh, one thing, one thing about writing the book on the precipice of a pandemic is that you, you know, there's some things that you wonder like, oh, I wonder if this is going to hold up six months or seven months from now. But certainly the, um, you know, the ways that technologies can expand rather than ameliorate inequalities um, is, uh, um, is really important. Another thing that I should say is that, you know, a huge influence on this chapter is my collaboration with Mimi Ito, um, who's at the University of California, Irvine. And, and actually this chapter sort of derives from a, 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 a report we wrote to together called From Good Intentions to Real Outcomes, um, Education Technology or, or Inequality and in Learning Design. At some point I'll have to re-record that sentence because I just didn't say the same thing right. But it was uh, From Good Intentions to Real Outcomes, Equity, equ From Good Intentions to Real Outcomes, Equity by Design and Learning Technology. Um, uh, so good. Well, let's let's pick some of these areas that we ought to be uh, delving more into. Um, you know, so Antero, like one of the claims you make is that s simply framing things in terms of the digital divide, like pretty much calling attention to any kind of digital pull, you know, eludes other kinds of inequalities. There's a ways of saying like, oh, we have a digital divide here. Um, conceivably means that like, oh, well, if you have a digital divide, you just need to like do technology stuff to fix it. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think is useful about the idea of thinking about digital inequalities and what's dangerous or problematic about thinking about digital inequalities? I mean, I think, I think it's good to talk about digital inequalities and digital divides because hopefully, because people hear half of that, they, they do hear divide and they do hear inequality. And that feels like an important and insidious component of how schools have, I think, have been intentionally designed for far too long. 
Um, putting the digital in front of it, I think is the, and I don't, I'm not, and to be clear, I'm not saying you're at fault for putting the digital, this is no, what we've great. been doing as a field for a very, very long time. Um, but essentially places the solution to these systemic problems in the hands of the ed tech folks that we've been talking about, right? As if they're going to fix uh, things that are rooted in race, class, uh, socioeconomic uh, connections to to how you know the foundations of U.S. schooling has been set up. Um, so I think that's that's where that's where both the problem and the possibility exists is uh, the overemphasis on a tool to fix a broader context, um, but the recognition that there is a broader context that needs to be addressed is may, maybe is I, I'm talking myself in circles here, um, but I think is an opportunity for for what this work looks like. I don't know, Audrey, is that is that how you'd think about digital divide? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the other things that I think about, and again, perhaps this is a weird time to talk about it because every, you know, so many of us are not in schools, um, in brick and mortar schools, but I think a lot about the technology, the, the architecture, the technology of the school itself. And I think that when we talk about digital technologies, it's sort of as though we're all these sort of ethereal bodies that actually aren't in physical spaces that look look at certain ways and those are often technological right i think you know one of the uh, i think liz loesch says that one of the most important education technologies is the window right and which classrooms have windows and which classrooms do not right um which what what kinds of students have to walk through metal detectors to get into school um and and I think that those are, those are the technologies that sometimes when we just talk about digital technologies, we all also aren't paying attention to, um, I think, like I said, the sort of embodied lived experience, um, because we sort of tend to think of everything as sort of being, I don't know, um, just these sort of, we're just like these data bodies, you know. Well, that, you know, Tressie McMillan Cottom has this line of saying that education technologists treat users as roaming autodidacts, as people disembodied from place, from geographies, from particular contexts. Um, and, you know, to, to some extent, they are people like education technology designers. I mean, a lot of education technology designers are people who graduated from Harvard or Stanford or MIT. They moved to either Cambridge, Massachusetts or Palo Alto or Austin, Texas. Um, and in any of those places, they could create, you know, the exact same community that they wanted. Like they could order from the same restaurants from Uber Eats and sit in the same Herman Miller on chair um, and use the same Apple laptop. And so to some extent, they were disembodied, um, you know, but the vast majority of people don't live that way. The vast majority of people are connected to a particular community, are oriented there, are engaged in their physical spaces. Um, you know, and, and I, I mean, I think there are limits to what, uh, what a smart, you know, the smart board is inherently limited as a design. But I do think it's the case that if you push a smart board into a classroom, which is already set up with no windows, with the chairs bolted forward towards the teacher's desk, you're going to get one kind of usage of it. Whereas if you roll a smart board into an open classroom where the furniture can move, you know, like you immediately open up a whole bunch of possibilities for use, which are like embedded in the broader context, not just in the device itself. Although the device itself also, you know, sort of has some things that are kind of constructed uh, in it to begin with. I mean, I think w one part I would I would just add to the way you you framed that kind of articulation is, in some sense, and you all, you also did this at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, you frame the the nature of digital inequities uh, as rooted in an in analog relationships, right? Like this idea of my food's going to be delivered by Uber Eats means that there's going to be a person in a car who's going to physically pick up the food that somebody else cooked for me, right? There there is a way that individual people's ingenuity, individual people's labor, the exploitation of people's labor and ingenuity, right, is at the heart of all of the stuff we're talking about with the digital. There's always people underneath it. Um, part of the way, I, I do a lot of literacies research, right? This is the kind of domain I spend a bunch of my time in. Um, and I tend former, to- Former English teacher, literacies <laughs> research. Yeah. So, so I tend to try to push against the framing of digital literacy by talking about analog literacy. I think it's important for us to think about the kind of human connections, the stuff, the windows, right? It's the kinds of technologies that we talk about. Um, 
particularly as I think I think one kind of set of theories that has been impacting the literacy space, at least with, for a couple of colleagues and myself, is the idea of platform surveillance, right? And the ways that plat platforms are shaping the kinds of information and sources of, of, of um, beliefs that are shaping classrooms. Um, but maybe, Audrey, to your point, I, we've been trying to make uh, the argument that classrooms and schools are a particular kind of platform as well, right? Platforms exist with particular values and pull in or push out um, different kinds of practices as well. And so, you know, I think I think I worry that we we merge together the words digital, the words technology, right? And the words of something like innovation as it's only tied to a thing like an app, right? Or, or the, you know, the, the imaginative space of something like an app rather than the kinds of vast ways that we are imaginative all the time. So what one of the ways that you framed this before, which I completely agree with, was something along the lines of, you know, look, you call these digital divides, but we don't necessarily solve them with technologies. We, we, you know, there are digital inequalities, but the way that you solve inequalities is through social movements, through politics, through organizing, not through technology. Um, and I think, you know, generally speaking, that's right. And yet, you know, there are education technologists who build this stuff. And part of what the second half of the chapter of the book tries to do is to say, okay, there should be no, I, I hope, I, my dream is that people read the first half of this chapter and go, okay, we do not need to discuss anymore whether or not emerging learning technologies exacerbate inequalities because they do. Um, the notion that new technologies democratize education, we can just kind of like stop doing that one because the evidence is now so clear and so overwhelming that they just, we should not assume they do that. But um, if we're going to build these things, that is a goal that we should aspire towards and we should be intentional about. And there's a series of strategies that we could take on. And here is the author. I'm really more speaking to education technology developers, to philanthropists, to venture capitalists and saying, look, if we're going to build this stuff, let's do a better job. And let's do a better job by um, building things that measure subgroups. Um, when people use stuff, let's figure out if it's just white people or if it's white kids and black kids or white kids and black kids of Native Americans or rich kids and poor kids, because if we don't measure how students are having different experiences, then we can't make claims about whether or not we're doing any better. Um, there's an argument in there which says we need to reduce the social distance between designers of technologies and the communities that use them. Um, we need to, you know, involve, you know, to, too often it is only, you know, a narrow slice of elite educated white and Asian men that get to build this stuff. And then it's a very diverse group of people um, who actually use it in, in, in America's public schools, you know, primarily black, African American, Latino um, kids who are using it. Um, there's a claim in there um, that we need to look really seriously at costs, that there actually could be some stuff that we could make free, where making it free would really help. And I use open textbooks as one example of this. But there's lots of stuff that when we make it free, we just make it easier for affluent people to use it. Um, so, so in that kind of range of, how does, how does that range of arguments then strike you? Um, are those... Um, you know, is it, is it reasonable to ask ed tech to pursue this or are there just other politics sort of too divorced from that? Or is it a distraction to talk about ameliorating digital inequalities when we really ought to just be focusing on ameliorating inequalities, period? Audrey, you want to start this time and then we'll let Tara yeah. fill in? Yeah, I, I mean, I would, <laughs> my, I would fall on the uh, structural work um, I think that that is, I think that is where, the, where the emphasis has to go. I think of, you know, there's been so much talk, particularly since everything has moved online about these online proctoring, uh, online proctoring tools. And I was trying to think of a way, like, is there a way that we could sort of like have a, like redesign or have a design orientation of online proctoring tools that, that would make these not you know, not horrific, exploitative, extractive, punitive, disciplinary, um, cop shit, right? And I, I don't know that that's the case. I don't think that we can actually sort of redesign our way out of some of the, of, of that particular technology um, and the practices that are, that it are built, that are built on. Um, I'm not sure that we can sort of design our way out of that. That there, that there may be, so there, there may, there's at least one class of technologies, exam proctoring software, at least, at least that, we, 
that we might say is like basically, you know, just completely irredeemable. Um, that uh, that there's that there's not more. Act- and and for folks who sort of haven't followed this discussion, um, you know, there's there are lots of reasons why educators instructional designers, people who care about young people are really opposed to this proctoring software. You know, it's basically like forcing young people to install malware on their machines um, in order to surveil them, to treat them, you know, as cheaters before they've even, um, you know, done anything. But what, like, what's worse than their baseline is that all, all these things work by taking camera data and running camera data through these algorithms um, and the algorithm Algorithms are not attuned to people's differences. Um, so, you know, there's a great story about a person who had a tick um, and they had never before classified their tick as a disability or learning disability because in the vast majority of circumstances in their life, it didn't matter that their eye twitched a little bit. People got used to it. Um, but here, you know, the system flagged them as a cheater. Um, or systems that don't recognize uh, dark skin, black faces, um, where you know people, people with black skin, people um, from Arab American backgrounds, you know, when they're setting up their room, they have to spend you know 60 minutes just trying to get the lighting right so the thing will recognize them. Um, you know, and white students just get to start taking their test or whatever else it is. So, so not only are they sort of terrible in general, but there are like specific ways in which they are documented to be systematically discriminatory. Um, all right, so there's at least one class of these terrible things, you know, it's probably irredeemable and we should not send Proctorio's CEO, you know, the sort of like four tips for making this thing more equitable. But Antero, what about the rest of the field? Is there any, is there any hope for it or? I mean, I guess to this point, right, I do think, I think it's a broader question of do we, do we send in the designers and the ed tech folks to create band-aids uh, for, for systemic issues. Well, it, I think there's, there's a running theme my, my colleague Nicole Muir and I have been writing about of this idea of, you know, is it about repair or is it about reconstitution, right? When it comes to, you know, the, the civic promise of, of schools in America right now. And I think this holds true for technology as well that we, yeah, we, you could think of like the, what is the culturally sustaining model of, of test proctoring online, right? But but at the, at the heart of it, it's always gonna, it's always in this value of of a sum of you know assuming who people are and trying to count them in particular ways. And I, w- I would imagine rather than doing that, right, I, w- I would reject the principle of someone else having to design us out of these inequalities, and rather think through like what's it ha- what's it mean to to your idea of like this proximal distal imagination of the designer and the communities for which they're designing from, right? Let's start with the community as the designer. And what's it mean to then imagine what schools and the tools that schools are going to need build from there, right? That to me seems like the, the starting place um, of, of the conversation. I, I tend to get grumpier as I think about other kinds of tools because I think they all are generally bad, right? All of, all of the surveillance stuff is, not only do I not trust the tool, but I don't trust the motives or the intentions of the companies that are making and, and selling these tools or of the designers, right? This, this idea of um, black skin and dark skin as being, you know, essentially demonized by different kinds of tools. This has been present since cameras and film have been around, right? This is the, this is the Kodak color test, right? This is, this is a thing that's been around uh, for my friend who is a filmmaker. Like she, she deals with this constantly as a black filmmaker and thinking about the ways that film and cameras are designed is not established for the lighting of black people's skin, right? Like th- this, isn't, this isn't new to online tools. It's, and this it's the, 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 co- the Kodak uh, prints that you're talking about is that there's a series of sort of standard prints of human faces that you would use to kind of normalize the lighting yeah. and the development of chemically developed photographs. Um, I assume most of us here are old yeah, thank, thank, thank you. what yeah. these things are. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, you know, essentially those things like made it so that you could more or less o- either only or only with, you know, the, the way you set up lighting typically and the way that you sell these chemical development processes um, made colors work for people with light skin, but not for people with black skin. So it's, so it's not, it, which, and I think the point you're making is it's not that like, oops, like artificial intelligence people screwed up by not, you know, like addressing this in their technology. It's like in the entire entire history of image processing, going back to the earliest days of film, um, this is a sort of running theme, which is like extensively studied and well known. And still we get it wrong again and again, um, uh, you know, because, uh, because, you know, the, the, our society is incentivized to, um, to, to be racist and oppressive in these ways. I mean, I think, so, so I hold two different 
I hold that true in, in the same space that I also recognize that there are ways that particular kinds of tools are leading towards powerful kinds of activism and social change. And those tools are problematic, right? So the idea of TikTok being a place where, you know, K-pop fans are able to disrupt US presidential um, electoral politics, I think is both uh, an exciting moment for me and a business as usual moment of like crowding a whole bunch of attention around a platform in ways that probably monetize something for somebody, right? Like there's this, there's a tension of, there are tools that exist that young people are using in ways that they're, they're learning powerful civic lessons. Um, but, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those are the right tools either. Like I, I also don't want to say, Hey, we need to jump everybody onto, uh, Facebook, Facebook, TikTok, Vine 3.0, or whatever the next thing's going to be, right? Those, those are all just as awful and insidious, just in different ways, and um, are less transparent about those practices than something like online proctoring software. Um, Kathy Fletcher from OpenStax asks a great question, which, in turn, I think you're very well suited because this, I feel like this connects to your career quite a bit. Um, I've been wondering about how ed tech can partner in substantial ways that are organ with organizations that are working on more structural work and equity, um, the ways that people are connecting education policy, housing policy, transportation policy, they all intersect and affect education. I mean, I feel like that's what a bunch of your work in LA Unified and certainly beyond that was about, um, you know, you were having students using education technology, you know, in the service of an education that was meant to be liberatory and that was meant to connect beyond just the topics that you were in um, and, uh, um, and the work with like learning how to use cell phones. It was learning how to do cell phones to do personal expression that connected with civic activism that had students yeah. asking the questions like, how come we're the ones with the cell phones and why don't the cell phones work here? Um, I don't know. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts about making those kinds of connections between, you know, I education think, technology intentionally as a site of organizing and activism? I think some of that's possible. I will say the spoiler alert. And so my book's free on the MIT site. They, they opened it up. It's on open access for. Great. What's the, the reminding name? It's called Good Reception colon something cheeky. I can't remember what the rest of the title is. So I'll find the link and I'll put it in the chat. But um, MIT put the whole thing up. So if people uh, need some some um, verbal ambient, right? You can just, you can read it at night to help you fall asleep. Teens, teachers, uh, and mobile media in a Los Angeles high school. That's it. Thank you. Uh, but the... Um, you know, the spoiler alert for that book is I went in assuming technology could help, you know, do these powerful things. And at the end of the day, I found that as a teacher, I reinforced particular kinds of power values. Um, <clears throat> and while, while the technology might be helpful, the school itself and the structures of school, the technology of schooling got in the way of what kids are really good at, right? At least that's, that's kind of my perspective. And this is the kind of, there is a, there's a tension towards the, the second half of your chapter, Justin, around this idea of, if we can kind of cluster around shared purposes and shared values, then we then I think this does get to this question, right, of like, how might we partner? And we partner by kind of moving in a similar kind of direction. I'm not convinced that the mechanisms, and, and there is another comment in here, I think it was from Sadia, um, I'm not sure that the mechanisms that drive most ed tech companies are the same ones that drive something like a public nonprofit schooling structure, at least that, that should be the spirit of how our country originally established schools. Um, if those two things are can mix are commensurable with one another. And so I think that that is a tension for me of are the shared purposes of teachers, of students, of the police authority with which we're complicit as educators, if these are all working in concert for the same kinds of visions of democracy. Um, I'm, I'm not even not convinced. I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was your the last bit of that sentence there is, you know, again, whose vision of school too, right? I mean, I think that that's I think that there are certainly, um, I think that there are incredibly important ways in which we, we have to change, we have to change schools um, in order to address, um, address inequality in this country. Um, schools, teachers um, are complicit in, in, a, in a lot of the, of perpetuating a lot of the inequality. And I think that, you know, asking, <laughs> having ed tech partner um, to serve the interests of schools can, um, actually is partly what gets us into this mess in the first place, right? There, this, you know, just to be specific, this getting a mess in the first place is something, you know, that um, these, these education technology companies are just 
constituted in such a way um, that they have beliefs that are antithetical to public schooling and a democracy. You know, they, they believe that substantial portions of teaching should be outsourced. The functions of teaching should be outsourced to private companies. Um, whereas, you know, in a, in a democracy, it might be really important to have education mostly be conducted by people who first and foremost see themselves as public servants. Um, that, uh, um, that you know the, the the education technology companies you know sort of have a profit motive that they you know that they in you know in a sense are sort of structured to see schools as kind of markets for products as like sources of revenue um, rather than you know first and foremost as institutions that serve a public good and that you know I mean like we might hope I mean one of you know one of the things that we talked about last week when we talked um, with Dan Meyer from Desmos um, is that we sort of admired Dan and his colleagues at Desmos for sort of finding a way of building a financial model um, that seemed to be one in, in which the people who worked for Desmos could um, have a set of values that like mostly aligned with the public education system. Um, but they did that like very cleverly on their own personal motives, conceivably at cost. And there's just no reason to expect lots of other companies to be able to do that. Are there, I mean, are there other components of, of that mismatch, Audrey, that, that you think are important for people to think about? I mean, I think that one of the, you know, one of the values, and I think it actually ties in with this chapter, one of the values in ed, that I see in ed tech is really the sort of exaltation of personalization um, at the expense, I think, of community, at the expense of um, democratic engagement. And so, again, I think that there's lots of, lots of these kinds of values, um, libertarianism, it was the radical individualism, um, Tracy's ideas of, of the roaming autodidact that are built into these tools in ways that aren't often, aren't often examined, but are really deeply embraced by the ed tech, um, ed tech companies. Yeah, and they're, and, they're, and they're not always obvious. And also, I, you know, one of the things that hopefully this chapter sort of brings up is that um, we often don't think of schools as political places or political projects. And to some extent, like, we there's a way in which we try to push the politics out of school, you know, don't, don't bring politics into local schools because our kind of national political discourse is toxic. Um, and we want schools to be places that are happy and healthy. Um, so yeah, look, it's, you know, it's just a thing that like algorithmically optimizes it's, you know, somebody's learning, like it just gives them some math practice problems. What's wrong with that? Um, you know, and in some ways, you know, maybe there's nothing wrong with it in, in certain places and certain uses in certain times. Um, but there's also a way in which like there's a set of values that are sort of embedded within that. I mean, I think exam proctoring software is a particularly good version of this because the values that are um, embedded in that seem so anathema to, they're so obviously anathema to so many educators. You know, the idea, you say, look, a proctoring software treats every kid as a potential cheater. And, and you know, and most teachers, I think through that frame will be like, I don't want to treat all my kids as a potential cheater. Like I like my kids. I, you know, um, I, I want to treat them as a human being as someone, you know, as someone with ethical potential. And there's so sort of no way of using proctoring software without kind of buying into that set of beliefs. Whereas in lots of other technologies, you know, if you point out in lots of ways, the beliefs are under the surface, just like in previous talks, we've talked about how the behaviorism is under the surface. Um, you know, and certainly, I think I, I find a lot of value in in sort of raising this up. Um, but in, in Tara, if you were writing the, you know, the second half of the book is meant to be a sort of what should educators do about it? Um, and what, what what would be some of the things that you would sort of put in this, you know, I think it's, you know, let's, let's given it's just like dispositively shown that new education technologies uh, disproportionately benefit the affluent, they typically exacerbates inequalities. Um, what, uh, um, you know, what, what, would, what would be your view of, of, of what, what would be your response to the, to the challenge of the second half of this book, which is like, how do we make things better? Yeah, I think, and there's, I think there's a, a question here from Eric around this, around, um, it, he writes that, my experience is that customers suck at designing good software experiences. To this idea that I think I was implying that community design, um, that the community do the design driven work. And I think even to that sentiment, I, I do think that that's kind of where I would start is what's it mean to take uh, a community? And first of all, I would problematize the word community 
and think of like whose community what do we mean by that usually usually we talk about community in this kind of deficit oriented thing of like the, the place where the kids are but not necessarily where the teachers live in, in a school space right? or the space that you know and it, and it is from a kind of a deficit perspective um but if we think about like the young people who we're working with and we center design principles with them i think there is a big possibility uh, i i uh, i think your colleague sasha chalk has done some nice writing around this recently i like i like their book a lot in terms of some of the framing around possibilities and the ways that limitations are, are oftentimes um, missed or, or, or disorganized around. So I would start there. I think the other thing I would, I would emphasize is before we worry about tools and bandwidth and all of that stuff, I think there is, I would recenter analog and relationships and, and I think healing to an extent. I realize that this is going to deviate a little bit from the ed tech conversation, but you know, we are, we are approaching a quarter of a million dead in this country and have, have yet to really have a moment to recognize the kind of mass trauma and grief uh, that we do not have the literal or figurative bandwidth to accommodate in, in these country in, in, in these schools right now. Uh, and at some point this is just this is just going to be a huge follow and there is no just to be clear there is no app there's no mindfulness tool that's going to somehow allow people to heal from this moment but we've been we've spent so much time worrying about the logistics of if our technology is working and if the right switches are turned on that we're treating everybody as um, automatons rather than autodidacts right like there is this kind of uh real tension with with you know the human the human capacity for even trying to uh, function in this space that just feels like such an important part for us to consider before we ever start the innovation design stuff. So if we start with the design principles of who am I and what do I need right now? Um, uh, or maybe, and is, I think actually, Audrey, to your point of the, let's move from the personalization to a collectivity. It's probably who we are and what, what do we need, I think, as, as a kind of building space. That would, that would be where I'd start, to be perfectly frank. And I would do that conversation at the elementary level, at high school level, at college level. Like this is, I think this is where we should be, is trying to recognize each other's humanity and build from there, rather than worry about what tool can I use to, to try to make things business as usual right now. Yeah, the, you know, even if there are some things that can be solved and advanced by that technical work. You know, this is, I feel like your comment is a through line that I encounter so often in work with education technology, which is somehow when it enters the conversation, the like technical components of it, rather than the human or pedagogical components, just get blown out to the margins. Um, I mean, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with schools 10 years ago as they were, you know, adopting tablet computers, iPads and other things like that, um, or, or even other kinds of one-to-one -one adoptions. Um, but you'd start, ask, you'd start asking people like, well, why are you doing this at all? Like why, did, like, why are you adopting iPads? And they would be like, I mean, literally in one presentation, something like, well, these iPads have this incredibly long battery life. And so you don't have cords in the classroom. You can, you know, they can just like run off the batteries all day. And I'm thinking like, I am as big a fan of workplace safety as like anyone else. Um, but not having no cords in the classroom is not a rationale for doing anything in schools. Um, you're, somehow, you're, somehow your mind has, has you know, become so focused on the logistical, on the technical aspects um, that ev even when I try to ask a leading question, like how do you want your students to be different because of these adoptions, um, you know, and I, and I do, I feel, I feel like it's sort of, I don't, I don't know why it happens so frequently. I feel like part of the way, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to find ways of like being really gentle and, and recognizing that humanity and in, in educators that I try to serve. And so I often want to come up with answers like, look, it just like, it takes a lot of mind share to figure out how to make the technology work. And it's not that unreasonable to say, well, making the technology work is the first step towards X. You know, I mean, to, you know, to your point, Antero, it, you know, it is quite radical to say, well, before we can think about getting students connected, we have to really understand where they're at. I mean, I think there are a bunch of IT directors and superintendents in this moment who would be like, no, 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 there's no school unless I can get them connected. Um, getting them, like, I can't even ask, I can't even have a conversation with them about where they're at until I get a hotspot in their house and a Chromebook in their hands so we can talk to them at all. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I think it is just immensely difficult in the conversation around technology to center humanity when you're trying to figure out all these various things uh, uh, around logistics. But just to, just to state the obvious, hopefully the obvious yeah. thing, right, is that because we focus on the logistics, like the the logic that allows us to focus on the logistics of opening schools and of making sure we have the Wi-Fi over the well-being and maybe the literal livelihood of community members 
is the settler colonial logic that, uh, that allowed us to, you know, embrace slavery as the foundation of this country, right? Like, I just want to, like, these, these aren't separated from each other, and they're not separated from the kinds of uprisings in light of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. I think all of these are interrelated. And to the other kind of, like, what do we do moment of this, right? Everyone had the summer to read their how to be anti-racist books and their, you know, white fragility books, right? And, and like, You've had your time to read books, ed tech designers around this conversation similarly. Like the time for action and the time for solidarity with communities rather than uh, doing research upon and designing on top of and profiting off of communities feels like like that the time is up, right? To, to quote Oprah, right? Like the, the time is up and now I think is the time for, for doing the intentional design with people. So I, I just wanna like inject that as a kind of like the, maybe, maybe where my, my feelings have been uh, with this for the last few months. Oh, it's I think that this is also so imperative right now because I mean some of this chapter talks about tech, tech going home, but I think in this moment, what tech, um, what school tech, and particularly if we think again about so much of this is wrapped up in carceral pedagogy and um, and often explicitly racist teaching, right? What does it mean when that tech comes home? Um, because it's now, literally, you know, students are ha in, having in their homes through the technology um, systems, um, systems and practices that are invasive, um, exploitative. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about the school to prison pod pipeline, but now, again, it's, it's coming into people's personal home life. And I think that that's, um, for me, that's, uh, it's, it's something that we, I'm not sure that a lot of people in ed tech are necessarily really thinking about what does it mean? Um, what does that mean when an institution of school that isn't always, in, in, isn't always seen as being a beneficial institution now is literally in, you know, on your desk, in your bedroom, um, watching you. And I think a huge part of the complexity around that and perhaps, you know, like a, I mean, it's a serious fault maybe of the education system, but also sort of American views towards technology, which is a kind of try it first and figure out the problems later, you know, sort of, you know, assume that it will work and then debug things afterwards. Um, that there was very, you know, when we, when we said, you know, we're going to send all of these machines home and everyone's just going to start teaching in their classroom. There was very little discussion early on about, you know, like what could be some of the negative consequences of that. Um, you know, people come up with long lists of all of these various rules of what you can and can't do um, in front of your Zoom camera. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think to folks who have looked at the, you know, racial disparities in discipline in schools, it becomes immediately obvious like, oh, those things are all going to be enforced in different ways for black students, Arab American students, Native American students than they are for white students. Um, we just know um, that, uh, you know, that teachers um, enforce subjective infractions more frequently and more harshly on some kids in their schools and not others um, along racial lines, along other kinds of lines. You know, and, and I mean, it strikes me as a kind of, you know, uh, piece for which technology is deeply implicated, but also there's like nothing design wise that can be done about it. There's, there's no work to be done for the technology designer there. Um, it's about systems saying, well, you know, if we're going to make this enormous change in the relationship between schools and homes, you know, who are we going to, who are we going to include in the conversations about those things? Whose values are we going to put front and center? Um, and uh, and how we make these choices, and I think you know, I think a, a great thing that both of you point up is that there is a sense of inevitableism around, like just inevitably we're going to give all the kids computers, and they're going to have Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Hangout, and that is the way we're going to do school. Um, and part of our jobs as educators is to push back on that inevitableism and be like, no, 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 there, there are like that is one way we could do things, but there are lots of other ways that 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 we could do things. I mean, I think for for teachers living on the ground, they probably feel much less of that sense of autonomy. I, I don't know, probably it connects back to what you were saying before, Antero, which is the which is you know. Um, educators with the strongest kind of liberatory designs are still constrained by the fact that they work in school systems and the people in school, you know, the leaders of school systems feel like they're constrained by school boards and their communities and, and those kinds of things. But they're also constrained by 
you know, I, I, and I'll, I'll own some of this responsibility, right? As someone who works in our teacher ed program here at Stanford, they're constrained by the, the lack of imagination we instill in how we prepare teachers and the ways that we hold the teaching profession as anything less than sacred right now, right? Like they, we, we take all teachers for granted and, uh, you know, it, it is it is a largely a profession that's under threat, I think, and, and I worry about that. Um, and, you know, I think to, to your point, yeah, we don't, this idea that school had to operate by something like Zoom and had to be via video in, in this way where I may not feel comfortable having kind of political or civic discourse in my classroom in my in my in my home because of who else might be listening, right? I might not be able to have the same kinds of uh, conversations with my teacher, for example. This, this is because this is the imagination of our schools and of the, the nationwide infrastructure that we've been developing for schools for, for a very long time. It could have been something else, right? We could, from from like the role-playing game world, right? Like the, this idea of play by post, if you play role-playing games by like mailing in responses back and forth, like analog mail, although mail is a mess also, so maybe I shouldn't, maybe that's not the right technology. But there's whole other ways that this could have happened, that schools could be transpiring. Like their classroom didn't have to be a whole bunch of kids with their cameras off being and muting themselves, right? Like that's not, it's not a space just because we're saying go on to this particular tool at any given time. Good. You know, so often we think of technologies as expanding our imagination, as making it possible of thinking about new ways of doing things. But there are also lots of ways that they constrain our imagination. We say, well, this is what we have available to us. Um, so this is what we're going to use. Um, well, Audrey and Ontario, it's been a wonderful hour and a wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, I think we've gotten at the heart of some really important questions about, you know, what in what ways can we design technologies to be more oriented towards equity? Um, to what extent should we make those commitments? And then where do we have to sort of, and I think those commitments are particularly important for people who have devoted their lives to education, um, because if you've devoted your life to education, um, you know, then, then you don't have the same time to, um, to be a policymaker or a civic actor or those kinds of things. But also recognizing um, you know, that, that our technologies can only be as good as the societies that we put them in, um, that the imaginations that we have for them, that those school systems that we create for them. Um, and, and there's much work to be done on those, uh, on those broader systems. Um, so Antero Garcia, thanks so much for joining us this week. It was really great to get a chance to catch up and, and to um, be in this conversation with you in this really hard moment. Yeah, thank, thank you. I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate getting me in conversation with you and Audrey. It's good to talk with both of you. And, everyone and Audrey, else, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us again. Terrific to have you, uh, you here. Right, right in the heart of, of a long body of your work too. Good. All right. Well, we're going to get together again next week. Um, we're going to be talking about the trap of routine assessment. Um, we've got Courtney Bell, formerly of the education tech, uh, no, of the educational testing service. Um, and now the University of Wisconsin coming in to talk with us about um, assessment technologies and how they get built and why it's so hard to make them any better. Um, and then the following week, we'll talk about the toxic power of data and experiment with Candace Till, um, who's here online. Um, so really looking forward to seeing you all again. Best of luck uh, surviving this week um, and, and assuming that our democracy is still functioning. We'll see you all next Monday. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Antero. Thank you.